All right, so let's get started. I would like to introduce our speakers today. We have Janine Anderson, our managing editor. Janine has managed remote and co-located teams for several companies. She spent most of her career in journalism and has been working in the SaaS industry since 2017. Reed Robinson is a Strategic Alliances Manager at Zapier. He works with some of our largest partners, including Google, Facebook, and Salesforce, to ensure users have the best integrations with their suite of solutions. Outside of Zapier, you'll see Reed in Vancouver, BC, playing board games and walking his pet, Corgi Oshi. Brian Helmig is the CTO and co-founder of Zapier. He's located in the Bay Area and has been with Zapier since the very beginning, nearly nine years ago. And fun fact, Zapier has actually been a remote company since day one, which is pretty cool. And all of our speakers are actually experts on remote work and remote work tools. And so I'm super excited for you to hear what they have to share. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Brian. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, before we get started here, I want to really quickly review uh, what we'll be covering. Uh, so first up, I'll give a quick intro on Zapier. Um, then we'll follow up with what we're seeing happen uh, in the world of automation. Uh, I'll hand off to Janine to cover what it's like to manage a team uh, that uh, is doing work remotely. Then I'll hand it off to Reed, uh, who will cover some of the collaboration apps you'll want to have in your toolkit, as well as some workflows uh, that go well with those. Finally, I'll take it over uh, and we'll cover some of the remote work culture, some of the tips there. Uh, before we hit uh, some of your questions uh, at the end. So first up, I want to give you guys an introduction on Zapier. I'm sure some of you know exactly what Zapier is, but some of you who may not be uh, so familiar, we're a tool that makes it easy to connect your favorite apps together to move information between them automatically. Um, we're an automate, automation toolkit, and as such, we connect lots of apps together. Um, over 2,000 uh, as of the recording of this webinar. Um, you don't have to use any code. You don't have to uh, be super technical to do this. Uh, it's really, uh, uh, really available to anyone. Um, and since we've been doing remote for such a long time, uh, we'd like to share a little bit of our learnings around uh, remote tools and remote apps very specifically. Um, but we have teams that are doing all kinds of stuff with Zapier, whether it be automating their marketing stack or onboarding new customers or sharing information between teams. Um, really, Whatever you can kind of imagine with your different tools, you can connect them and stitch them together with Zapier, which makes it really, really powerful. And finally, we are remote. Uh, we have been remote since day one. Um, we're over 300 employees right now working in lots of different time zones. Uh, so we've uh, definitely uh, learned a lot on the way and we wanna take this opportunity to share uh, some of that with you. So next up, uh, one of the unique positions we have uh, connecting all these different apps together is we get to see the shifts, the ebbs and the flows of what's popular uh, and what uh, people are using. Um, and we've definitely seen big changes in the way us users are uh, using apps uh, in Zapier. Um, the first thing up, uh, lots of folks using Zapier for COVID response. Uh, we see Zaps with Corona or COVID uh, in their titles. Um, not surprisingly, uh, as they work through this, I think we're all kind of uh, on our heels trying to do the best we can here. So folks are using Zapier to do that. Um, but the highest surge we've probably seen on the app side of the tool side is really around collaboration. So you can imagine those are things like this, uh, webinars, video conferencing, team chat, those sorts of tools are really seeing uh, a, a surge uh, in their usage and Zapier can help you connect and automate uh, those tools as well. The second highest is probably apps that are moving folks to a more online presence. Uh, so things that would have traditionally been done in person or done offline, brick and mortar, are being shifted online. Um, we'd like to come back and do that in another webinar in the future because we find this uh, really interesting and something that's really powerful uh, for folks who are you know, shifting to this new world. Um, so you know, stay tuned, uh, we'll definitely come back to that. Uh, the biggest decreases uh, in some of the apps, uh, not surprisingly, event management, uh, you know, large crowds of people uh, is not a, not a good idea. So uh, that's taken a bit of a backseat, as well as some of the more sales motion or accounting uh, facing uh, use cases. Uh, those are uh, a little bit uh, suppressed uh, in the current environment. So with that, I want to hand off to Janine, who's going to talk us through some of the uh, remote tools you should be using. 
Thanks, Brian. So um, as we get moving into this next section, I wanted to throw up a poll for you guys and just get a little bit of feedback right away from you on some of these things that you're experiencing now that you're working remotely yourselves. Um, so from these options, I just want you to check in and see what you're finding the most challenging about being remote now. It's about thinking about tools or knowing what your team members are working on, sticking to schedule, just kind of curious what the things are that you're experiencing so far. Um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit more here was managing a team and managing your work once you've moved into a remote work situation. If you're like most of the people that I know, you've probably been working remotely for a couple of weeks, and that means that you figured out how to get the most critical work done, but you're starting to maybe see some of the gaps in your processes. That's one of the things that I find can be really hard to account for when you first go remote. It's things like the, the in-person connections that helped make an office environment work that suddenly you can't do because you don't see people in person all the time. It's maybe somebody who distributed mail and faxes, which got incoming information from outside into the hands of the right people. And now that stuff is just stuck in one place and you can't hand it out as easily. Or perhaps you were somebody who walked around the office and got some information from a salesperson when you wandered past their desk every day, but now you don't do that. And it seems kind of awkward maybe to just be like, hello, I wanted if you could tell me a thing and just slide into somebody's DMs in that way. Um, or sometimes someone might just have seen you at your desk and thought they had information you'd find valuable or they just wanted to say hello because they liked you. Those things can be a little bit harder to figure out once you're remote. And if you're managing a team or a project, you also tend to start to worry about how you're going to keep track of the work or how people are doing. And that's just not as easy to see because people aren't right in front of you. You can't tell that somebody's heads down if they've got their headphones on and are super focused, or even if they're at their desk versus out making a call or taking care of some other business they need to do. We're going to go through some things that uh, address some of those pieces here next. So this. This next part we want to talk about, um, as people registered for this webinar, we'd asked you a couple of questions to answer a question for us. And we took that and found these three, which really fit nicely into some different buckets of topics that we saw people um, asking about. So things like, do normal work hours make sense anymore? How are you going to monitor productivity without micromanaging? And how do you manage cross-company collaboration without adding to the noise that comes when you're dealing with a remote work environment? So I've managed remote and co-located teams, and I find that many of the skills that I needed to employ were the same, but I have to do them a little bit differently when we're working remote. So I'm gonna walk through these three questions a little bit more in detail with a really strong focus on how to do this in remote work so that all of you guys can be a little bit more confident uh, coming out of here and how you set up your team and your work going forward. So to start with um, managing a team or a project, in terms of the normal work hours, right now for me, I really think this is a huge, it depends. I don't work normal hours. I have two kids at home and my husband is also continuing to work full time from here. So there's just moments when I have to step away to help my family. And the same is true for everybody else who's on my team right now. There's moments that um, we all need flexibility. And if you are able to offer that flexibility, I really encourage you to do so. I, for me, myself right now, I get up and put a few really focused hours in first thing in the morning before anybody else in my team is up or anybody else in my house. And then um, I'm able to stay on top of urgent Slack requests when I step away from the computer a little bit more so that I am able to focus on the kids, help them with some schoolwork. And then I come back on later on in the afternoon to kind of focus a little bit more and, and get some of those tasks done that came up in the middle of my day when I took a little bit time away. Um, so these are some of the things that we find really help us here at Zapier um, consistently, not just during this period, but all of the time. Um, per start with making it really clear which meetings or tasks are non-negotiable or which ones are deadline driven and let other things move around as needed. You want your team to be able to adjust to fit their life and business needs. So being really clear about what's a must and what's a we should helps people prioritize and make those adjustments on the fly. You want to set standards for transparency around schedules and make sure that if you can't be around at a certain time of day, you want to state it up front and then work through these problems collaboratively. And if you're in management, it's really important to lead by example. It's much easier for your team to take you at your word when you say flexibility is an option if they see you also being flexible too. And then you want to really think about what's possible to do asynchronously. If a meeting is primarily to share information, figure out if you can maybe write it out in a document or make a meeting that's a recording to be shared with folks who can't make it. And you also want to be able to circulate things ahead of time for feedback. And then you can have a shorter, more focused meeting that's really about coming to a decision. Um, for monitoring productivity without micromanaging here, one of my former managers in an office held daily five minute stand ups with everybody on the team. It made sure he knew what we were working on and we had a chance to adjust priorities if we needed to do so. If that's how you worked before and now you're remote, you could, instead of having these five minute meetings, you could switch to doing just like a, a DM with somebody to get 
to figure out what they're working on, or if you want some more transparency and to really reduce the noise and that might come in for people trying to figure out what everybody else is doing, you could instead set this practice of posting a daily work in a specific channel in your team chat program. That's what my team does here. I included on this, uh, on this slide a screenshot of one of my coworkers, Joey's status from a couple days ago. He put his things in and then a little bit later in the day, things changed and he had a meeting get canceled and decided to run an errand in the middle of the day. Um, so he just let us all know there and then we all understood what was going on and it was easy for everyone to stay on top of how his day had shifted. If you want something that's a little bit more dynamic, there's also tools that you can use um, to kind of send people a questionnaire at the beginning of the day, and then that collects all of these answers and posts things in a channel for people to, to review. And always, once you know people, what people are planning to work on, it's easier to set different priorities or to switch things, especially if you're seeing your needs changing pretty quickly. And then you want to always clearly communicate goals and then kind of uh, adjust as things change, like, like Joey did in his, in his status there. Um, then next up, we're going to be looking at managing teams and projects with cross collab company collaboration without adding to all of this noise that can come in, especially if you're adjusting to using new tools. You want to really try to shift away from verbal communication into written. That gives people more flexibility to set their focus time and then look at when they're going to respond to requests. Whether it's email or team chat or project briefs that you can do, this minimizes the back and forth questions that interrupt people's work time and can help to reduce the number of meetings that get scheduled. It also helps make sure that anybody who needs the information later is able to find it because it's written down, it's in a public place, and they can access it themselves without having to make a bunch of requests. You also want to really be transparent. If you can, keep your tasks and your projects and your progress on things in a public place, like a Kanban board that everybody can see or some kind of shared database. My team's editorial calendar is an Airtable, for example, and we're all able to go in and make changes, and we can share that link with others in the company who might want to know what kinds of things we're working on and where a particular piece of work is. You can also use Zapier to automatically be notified when things move through that system. So for example, in something like this Trello board, you could have a Zap set up, set up that alerts somebody in the team chat program or an email when they get added to a card or one that sends a message to a channel when a card gets moved into a new stage. That can, again, just really reduce the number of times you need to ask people what they're doing or trying to figure out what someone is working on. I'm going to hand things off to Reed now, and he's going to go through some of the tools that we found are really critical for working remotely, and then go into detail about how to set things up for one area that we know can be a little bit dicey, remote meetings. So thanks, Reed. Thanks, Janine. Uh, and yeah, as Janine said, managing remote meetings was one of the biggest areas we received questions about. And it makes a lot of sense. A lot of people probably try to take their in-person meeting formats and just duplicate them on a video call before realizing it didn't really work that well. Uh, and now they're trying to figure out how do you actually do this? Uh, and it makes sense. Remote work requires you to do things differently. And depending on how you worked before, it likely means you implemented some new tools or expanded on ones you were previously using, whether that's video conferencing to enable remote and one-on-one -on -one meetings, team chat tools such as Slack or Microsoft Teams to provide a place to ask small questions and share ideas. Uh, and I highly recommend using chat as a great place to build on remote culture. I know Brian will touch on that a bit later. Uh, and of course, an online file system for documentation to ensure everyone knows where to put things uh, and anyone knows where they can also find information. And to help with this transition, I'm going to share a few tips and tricks that we've learned about running efficient remote meetings. You'll see a few things here and we're going to be providing an ebook afterwards so you'll get a lot of this information afterwards. Uh, so you don't need to be scribbling away notes too hard. So to start, Let's acknowledge remote meetings are different. They can even be a bit awkward when you're used to being in person. They can sometimes feel formal rather than more natural. Uh, for me, when I started at Zapier, which was really only eight months ago, so a lot of this is quite fresh in my mind, the hardest part was when I'm speaking, it's hard to get that immediate feedback you're used to when everyone's in the same room. And you start to realize that that nonverbal communication that you relied on really played a critical role. So how do you become a pro at remote meetings? Uh, these are some of the things that we've learned at Zapier, and I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail. But the four things we really recommend figuring out with your team and for yourself are agreeing on the tech you use ahead of time, be intentional about your communication, follow your company's video call etiquette or start to create one, 
And lastly, think, do you really need a live meeting? Many companies have actually struggled with that last part when they're in person already. So making it remote makes things even more tempting to create a lot of meetings. In fact, that's actually one of the biggest complaints I've personally heard from friends that have suddenly shifted to remote work is that they're on so many meetings that they don't actually have to get time to get things done. Um, and with remote, there's a lot of flexibility for you to set up standards that work for you and your team. But these are the areas we found important to set up as you get started. And so let's go into things in a bit more detail here. So what does it mean to agree on tech protocols ahead of time? To start, it means knowing who's actually going to be hosting the meetings before things get started. Uh, even better, if the meeting host can actually put a link for the calendar invite uh, to have it done there, you can even do it automatically for posting to the team. Decide where your written chat is going to be during the call. Uh, for instance, you know, for anyone that's using Zoom like we do internally, there's a lot of chat that can happen in the Zoom chat, but important questions that people have for us sometimes go into Slack instead. And the reason for that is because chat during a video call can oftentimes get lost. So if you get into the habit internally of making that into a separate tool that you use that's more long term, uh, it makes it great to do that. We also use tools like Slido uh, to aggregate Q&A during a meeting. Um, and if you can determine ahead of time if the meeting will be recorded, it really helps everyone on the team. Uh, I'd also recommend, as you can see here as an example of what we do, we create a clear structure of where meeting recordings are hosted. So you don't need to be going back to the meeting host after every time and like, hey, was that meeting rec recorded? Where can I find it? We actually use a tool uh, and in that we store all of our meeting recordings uh, and teams have their own folders. And this really helps people who may have had to miss that meeting um, or maybe they just want to watch it again to catch up on something. It can really be a great habit to get into. And next up, really, you know, going to that part about that nonverbal communication that's happening now, uh, you really have to be intentional about this. Uh, and honestly, be sure to ask for feedback as well and chatter verbally on how things are going. Some of the things we've seen work, call on people by name to encourage participation, make sure everyone has a chance to contribute as well. Uh, one thing that oftentimes feels unnatural is to pause longer than usual before continuing. Uh, this can account for any lag, you know, a lot of people's Wi-Fi is being like really hammered right now. So really be intentional about that as well. If you're leading the meeting, uh, these things can certainly take some getting used to. Um, and if you're an attendee, remember that your face might not actually be on the speaker's screen, or if it is on the screen, it's going to be really small. So reacting in the chat can really be helpful or using larger gestures. So instead of like nodding your head, which can be really hard to tell, maybe do like a giant thumbs up right in front of the camera, something that's a lot more obvious that people can start to see and notice becomes really helpful. And one of the last things is establish a system for questions. So if you're doing live meetings and you wanna be encouraging people to ask questions, one of the things that we've found that really helps uh, either if you have a group of people that are too rambunctious and, and too loud and keep talking over each other and you need to figure out how you get that in order, or you have a group of people that might be really long amounts of silence and to avoid that kind of like popcorn style of conversation, what we do is we say, hey, you know, once you've reviewed the information or if you have questions, please type next in the chat. And then someone who's running the meeting or assisting in running the meeting will actually grab that all together and you'll see here. So we have the question orders with David, Nick, Scott, Kim, uh, and so forth. It's a great way to help get your team kind of organized as well on the call. And for video etiquette, uh, I'm not sure if some of you saw this wonderful tweet that went out a bit earlier, but it's really important that you do follow your, your company's etiquette. Some of the things that we always recommend, mute yourself if it's a large meeting or in your you know you're in a place with some background noise. Uh, it helps keeps everyone's focus on the actual speaker who's presenting. Uh, we also default to having video on so our coworkers can see reactions. Um, the feedback we're used to getting in person meetings is missing and video can't replace all of that. Uh, but seeing your coworkers engaged faces really does help the speaker and it probably helps each other just remember that we're all still like a group of people working together um, and getting through this as best we can. 
and this one can be really hard, but try to avoid distractions. Um, one of the things for me that really helps is I actually maximize the video call that, call that I'm in. So if I'm in a Zoom, I'll full screen it. I'll mute my Slack notifications. I'll mute my Apple Mac notifications. Uh, so I can be really focused and present on the meeting. Because if I have a bunch of notifications coming in from my phone or from Slack or from email, it becomes really difficult. Uh, and oftentimes work from home distractions are different. You know, instead of a, someone testing the fire alarm or a ringing phone in the background, it might be your pet, it might be children, it could be roommates, it could be your partner. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And I think it's important for people to understand each other. Everyone's gonna adjust to work from home. Interruptions are going to happen. Just acknowledge them, manage them, and try to be able to move on and regain focus as quickly as possible. At Zapier, you know, I talk a lot about what do we do to manage remote meetings. And that last point I had was, do you really need a remote meeting? Uh, and I really mean this because oftentimes with remote work, it's really so tempting to just be like, hey, we're all home when I know you're home. Let's just hop on a call for this. Um, but that can really add up and people start to become overworked because they're on so many meetings that they need to spend extra hours to actually do their own work. Or they might just be you know, becoming just bogged down and not being able to focus. So how do you get around that in a remote working environment? Well, for us, what we do is embrace the role of asynchronous work. Uh, it's really just fancy speak for not everything needs to be done at the same time. So how do you get work done if you're not working at the same time? For us, it means a shift for, to a lot more written communication. Um, and this could be a muscle that a lot of people have to learn how to practice again, how to do proper written communication. For us, one of the things that we use that I've actually learned and become a really big fan of are, are what we call DASIs, pronunciation of which is highly dependent, DASI, DASI, um, it, it's a good debate internally to have. Really, it just stands for driver, approver, contributors, and informed. It's basically a document that you put together when you have a decision and it outlines who's involved, how we got there, why it's a problem, suggested solutions, and their pros and cons. The document is then shared with everyone that's involved for feedback. And by doing this, we significantly decrease our need to discuss things live in a meeting. It gives everyone time to digest the information, share their opinions, and then you all agree, or you have people who ultimately do make that decision, and you share that decision internally. Um, so you'll see how that can start to decrease your need to discuss things live. Um, you could even put together a dossier, hand it out to everybody, get their feedback, and then do a 30-minute live meeting instead of maybe a 90-minute one where you were going to run through the decision, talk about it, and then debate it. Um, you really want to start doing as many things as you can through written communication because it's a lot more efficient when everyone's working remotely. And lastly, you really use automation to support your remote meeting strategy. It helps keep everyone focused. It removes the need to remember small, repeated things, uh, especially if you're also adjusting to new workflows. Anything you can do to help keep the attention on work and not remembering things like how to join a video call or where is something stored, it can really help. Uh, at Zapier, no surprise, we most often use Zapier to support our meetings by automatically creating agendas, sending reminders for upcoming meetings. Uh, that's an example of one you see here at the bottom right. And getting reminders about actions to take for when those meetings end and what you need to be doing to prepare for an upcoming meeting. So the example here that you're seeing is something we do in Slack, which if there's an upcoming meeting, there's a, a zap that will post to the people in Slack who are on that meeting, uh, along with the Zoom link that they need to join and a link to the agenda. And that agenda was also created with a zap. So how do we actually do these things in Zapier? And these are just a few examples uh, that I'm gonna share. And once again, we're providing an ebook afterwards. It'll have links to all of these apps so you really get some information on how to do this. Um, but a quick few examples, if you're using a scheduling app to book meetings, whether that's things like Calendly, uh, Zapier can really help you make sure the information is included on your actual calendar invite. Uh, a Zap like this can automatically create a Zoom meeting when a Calendly event is scheduled. 
Uh, you have other ways to do it, like connecting your meeting calendar to your video conferencing app so that whenever a meeting is scheduled, a video meeting is created. Um, and these workflows work for other apps too. You know, it might just not be Google Calendar and GoToMeeting. You might be using various other tools. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can start to do with Zapier across our app directory of 2,000 apps. Another one that we internally use quite a lot is using Zapier to automate the creation of agendas. Uh, having agendas ready for review in advance, just like that dossier, it really helps everyone come prepared to the meeting and make decisions faster. Um, and if that becomes the doc for taking notes, there's no need for someone to create something new and remember to put it in the right place. Zapier can actually create that note document ahead of time. It can ping it to you in Slack right before the meeting starts. Um, and everything's in a nice, even place. And it's saving you time from doing things over and over again. And one of the last examples I'll share is after a meeting ends, it can be really easy to forget what are those next steps, when you need to be doing them. Uh, so one of the things that we also do is we set up regular reminders to follow up and keep everyone on track and keep those things moving forward. So these apps can remove the reminders from your to-do list and help get them into everyone else's hands. Great, well, I hope that helps give you a sense of some of the tools and how we use tools internally in Zapier to really manage remote work and some of the things you could learn. I'm gonna hand things over to Brian now, who's gonna talk really more about what can you be doing to ensure your company culture is growing and thriving in the time of remote work. Awesome, thanks, Reed. Um, now that you have a little bit of an idea of both managing the work in a remote culture, uh, some of the tactics there, as well as some of the tools and some of the automa automations you can use, we want to dig into a little bit of the culture behind a remote team because it's very different. We have introverts and extroverts and that kind of mix uh, plays out differently in a remote first culture. Um, so there's three broad areas we're going to cover. One is really creating spaces for that non-work chatter, right? Finding ways to be together even when you're apart um, and no surprise automating uh, these sorts of reminders and these sorts of connections uh, so that they happen more automatically. So let's start with the first one. This is really about designating spaces uh, for non-work chatter. Can we get the next slide here? Um, and this is all about uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the space you create inside uh, of your uh, workspace. Um, and in our case, we use Slack a ton. So we have uh, these rooms that we've created called fun. They're prepended with fun and they have all kinds of different topics. And they're really just spaces for non-work content to go without being distracting to uh, the uh, content uh, that people are doing uh, on the day-to-day -day basis. And we have a ton of these. So we have them for crafting, we have them for, uh, for beer, craft beers, we have them for video games and TV and music and parenthood and uh, coffee, you name it, there's a topic uh, that someone's interested in, they probably created a fun a room. It really lets people share uh, their interests and build stronger relationships with each other. Um, you can kind of think of these as your sort of virtual water coolers that you're creating um, because, you know, we don't have those kind of real uh, in-life uh, interactions. So you have to create spaces uh, for that. Next up, we have uh, finding ways to be together even when you're apart. Um, and this goes back to some tooling that you can adopt. Um, we use this tool called Donut. Uh, it's a fantastic tool. And it's pretty simple. Um, it just connects you with a random person in the org uh, once a week. And I think you can configure it to be however you like, but it just randomly pairs you with that person. You get together and then you just talk about whatever. Um, the, you know, the, the topics range from what's going on in your personal life uh, to you know, what you've been working on. It really can cover anything. There's no real set agenda. And it's really about creating kind of the space uh, for that. Uh, but you can also expand that into other things. It doesn't have to be on a schedule. You can have these uh, little uh, happy hours or um, uh, sometimes we have folks do kind of Netflix uh, parties where they all watch Netflix together or watch a show together. Um, so there's lots of different ways to express this, uh, even in a remote environment that can you know, bring people uh, together a, a little bit closer. And then finally, really, uh, we're talking about automating this sort of a stuff. So if you're in an office, you know that these sorts of things happen just implicitly as a part of being in the workspace. It's that flavor of serendipity as you're walking to uh, your next meeting or um, you're grabbing a bite to eat or whatever. You run into someone and you have a chat and you catch up with them. And 
that is just kind of baked into your day to day. When you're in a remote environment, it's much harder to get that. So what you can do to supplement um, those sort of serendipitous things is build some automations that uh, trigger those touch points. So it could be everything from things that are posting the different weather uh, across uh, different teams uh, working uh, uh, time zones or what name have you to pulling in a GIF uh, when those kind of fun channels uh, light up uh, to kind of match the, uh, the, the topic of conversation to little reminders to just thank people and uh, uh, you know, spread some gratitude. Um, and you can set these up. There is one of the really cool things you can do is you can set these up to post as you, um, or to kind of play that part where it feels more natural, right? So it doesn't have to post it as some, you know, uh, mandatory fun bot, but it can actually be something from your own personal account, inviting someone in or, um, making that touch point or pulling people together. Um, and that happens automatically to supplement that sort of stuff that you might get in an office uh, overall. So those are some of the tips and I'm happy to dig into more of that and in kind of the Q and A if folks have questions, but really, you know, to summarize this whole uh, webinar, you want to start with finding the tools that's going to, that are going to support remote work. That means online tools. That means tools that you can uh, use from anywhere that your team can collaborate with. You want to establish some protocols that really help support your team. So when you're running these meetings and you're doing your work asynchronously, that everyone's kind of on the same page. You want to have those processes be automated. You want systems that help keep you on track so that you're not spending all of your time just keeping uh, the wheels turning. Um, instead, you're focusing on higher value uh, work. And Zapier can obviously be a big part of that. And then finally, you don't want to forget to care for each other because we are social creatures and it is really important to keep that connective tissue uh, in the organization, uh, no matter where people uh, are located. So you can also uh, layer that into your organization as well. And with that, I think it wraps the content portion of our webinar. And I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Katie, who's gonna walk us through uh, some Q&A. Great, thank you all, that was amazing. So next we're gonna turn it over to questions, but before we do, I just wanna remind you all that this is recorded and we will be sending you the recording afterwards along with ebook that includes some of the zaps and best practices that we used. Um, after you exit the webinar, you'll also see a survey pop up and we'd love to get your feedback on the webinar. All right, so let's go to questions. Um, looks like this first question is, is there a zap database that is publicly available? Can I see the zaps built for collaboration tools? Yeah, I can help out with this one. Um, Katie, can I share my screen for a minute on this one, actually? Yeah. Excellent. Should be able to. So we have, oh, I can't do it yet. Uh, Reed, can you stop your screen share so I can grab it for a minute? Thank you. I am gonna just do this. Okay, so we have part of our website is what we call the app directory. So it's, if you go into zapier.com and you find this little button up here that says apps. This is the, um, the place where you can kind of search for any app you want. You can explore different categories. It's a great resource. Um, specifically, if you want to get into some of the team chat type things, we use Slack at, at Zapier. Um, and so once you get into the Slack page, the overview kind of tells you about the app itself. The integration section is really where you can dig in on what you can do with Zapier and this particular app. So you can kind of do a, a little section here where you can build some of these things yourself and explore. But as you get farther down, this right here is a list of Zap templates. So these are um, kind of pre-built workflows, guided workflows, you can think of them, that offer some of the steps you're gonna need to be able to do something yourself. And you can kind of, when you click try it, it kicks you right into your Zapier account and many of the fields are already filled in. So you just have to authorize your apps if you haven't done those yet, set some of the really specific field mapping that you need, and then you can get going right with that, with that there. So if you open it up, <clears throat> by just clicking on it and avoiding the try it link, you can learn a little bit more about how it works. And then you can kind of just head right in. And we have that for a couple different, uh, different chat apps. This was, uh, this is what we have for Microsoft Teams, if that's what your team uses instead. Um, there's again, just this like kind of long list and you can keep hitting load more for quite a while and get down there. But this is a really good way and say that you knew that you wanted to connect Teams with, um, with Outlook. You can type Outlook in here, get this. And then there aren't any. Um, I'm going to go into Slack since I use Slack more. It's easier for me to know some of those um, those apps here. But if I wanted to go up here, say that I knew that I wanted Google Forms and I have a like a form set that's going to collect input from my 
customer base and I want to make sure I find those in a Slack channel, I can use this one. Um, I just used this step template myself uh, last week when I set something up. So this is one of the best places that we have if you know the apps you're going to use to start to kind of narrow down and find some of those easy to use apps that you can grab and use for yourself. Great. Thanks, Janine. All right, so this one might be a good question for Reed, but anyone else can chime in. How important do you think it is that people can see each other in meetings? We lose so much context when we have only voice and text. That's a great question. Uh, for me, I think it's, you know, we, at Zachary, at least we try to default to video on. However, we do have a number of colleagues who just prefer not to do video and that's totally cool too. I think you need to be respectful for what people want to operate with. Um, but I think the video certainly helps you see those kind of nods and they see the thumbs up. Um, it also sees smiles. I know, especially these days when everyone is probably seeing a lot less people than they're normally used to. Um, it is good, uh, at least I find it very helpful for me to be able to see my colleagues, be able to just connect with them. And it, you know, oftentimes in meetings, you have that kind of three minutes or so beforehand where you catch up on life, see how everyone's doing, see how everyone's families are. Um, and that's a lot nicer when you can actually see everybody and, and see what's going on. Um, I'm sure a number of you have also done the kind of introduction to your houses and your pets. Um, and that kind of helps break, it, it give things a little bit more lively spirit as well. It's just like seeing how people live, seeing their pets. Um, it's a great way to kind of stay connected. Great. Um, okay, this one might be a good one for Brian, but again, anyone else can answer too. What have been the most effective ways your remote company has created meaningful engagement between employees and encouraged company culture? Yeah, that's a great question. And some of the things we talked about in the webinar, I think are probably, I would say, the most effective in terms of effort to kind of output is just adopting some of those tools that are the best for these sorts of things and creating some of those processes. So I would suggest something like Donut, um, right? That's a very cheap thing to add and can really help pull kind of this company culture um, forefront and into the daily sort of, the daily bread, so to say, of how uh, you run your org. The, a lot of the more, you know, the more effective, but of course, much more significant, you know, work would be really looking at your value system as an org. Like we've been remote for almost a decade now, and it really permeates the way we do work and why it's so important to have the values we have. And I'll just kind of mention too, one of our first value is default to action. So the idea here is if you have to wait for someone else to kind of give you permission to do something um, or, you know, allow you to do, you know, a, a part of your job or you name it, then you have this latency that's introduced because we have people who work around the world and that just slows business down just a ton. So we have this kind of default to action value, which says, hey, as long as this isn't a permanent change, um, like don't go signing a million dollar contract or something like that. But if you're just trying to help a customer help unblock a, another uh, teammate, just go ahead and do it. And if it was a wrong call, we'll, we'll undo it, right? It's better to be kind of uh, active there. The second one is around defaulting to transparency. So that the folks have the kind of context they need to make the decisions uh, they have, uh, they, they need to make, right? So for example, a lot of our internal finances are 100% open. So you can go and read to see exactly how uh, we're doing from week to week, which has been really important here in the current uh, pandemic and economic crisis, where the teams can orient around that and that to me is like more fundamental to your culture than perhaps like adopting a tool here or there and requires a little bit more of a mindset shift. Um, so it really depends on how far down that spectrum you wanna go. Do you want something kind of quick and easy that gives you some fast dividends or do you wanna go a little bit deeper and really embed these values into the way you do work that are a little more compatible with remote. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not a either or sort of a thing, but you can do a both and uh, as well and kind of tweak those uh, as you go. Great. Thank you. Another question maybe for you, Brian. Um, how do you monitor productivity without micromanaging your employees? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think th the tactics you'll find for a lot of management are still, like the fundamentals are still there. So the kinds of things you want to avoid in micromanaging in an office space 
is the same thing you want to avoid in uh, a remote uh, environment. So the kinds of things of like popping in and looking over someone's shoulder or constantly being uh, up in their business would feel like micromanagement, right? So I, I find an easy way to do this is really through expectations. Um, and I'll give you an example. If, if you're really, if a, if a project is really important and you need to stay in touch with it, instead of setting up a model where you are constantly going out and pulling information uh, from that uh, direct report or what have you, just set expectations to say, hey, can you report on this each day in the morning? Uh, this is really important to me. This is something that uh, I wanna keep really close tabs on so that I can help and keep you on blog, blah, 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 whatever it is. That's a really healthy expectation setting that will get you what you need without feeling like micromanaging. And that's not, you know, a, a, a crazy out there remote tip. That's just like good management, right? So a lot of the fundamentals don't really shift, um, though you may have more convenient ways to get that because you might have a tool that could assist in getting that report, or you might have uh, a process in which they can communicate that to you asynchronously and you could catch up on it um, in a way that doesn't, you know, block their time or break their context up or anything like that. So Again, not a not a, a huge you know fundamental uh, uh, shift on remote, just kind of a small tweak here or there. Great, that's awesome. Okay, uh, Janine, this one might be good for you. So we want to implement daily virtual standups. Any suggestions? I'm a super new user to Zapier. Signed up yesterday. Yeah, one of the things that we use here for some of these tools, um, so the, the what we use for my team in terms of just posting daily work priorities is just that's the standard, everybody does it. They just post a message in our Slack channel. We don't use it quite as much as a standup. Some of the teams here that do use standups, um, and I have a weekly standup kind of uh, question that comes in through an app called GeekBot, which is in Slack for us, and it uh, posts a series of questions, you fill them out, and then it uh, kind of shares them in a channel so that everybody can see what people are working on or what they've learned. The one that I participate in um, every week is around customer support and how we are using that to inform our work. So that asks me some really specific questions, and then I'm able to share that, and everybody else that's working on that particular project is able to see my answers. I'm able to see all of theirs, and it really helps. Um, I think that using a, a format like that is really helpful. Um, I don't know, Brian, do you use GeekBot with any of your teams or read? Those, the ways that I use it are really project-based as opposed to managing a team specifically, but I find it really helpful. And those are meetings that would have been, um, for someone trying to monitor all of those responses, it would have been too many for them to manage on their own in kind of individual meetings. But GeekBot makes it really easy and clear to get the information you need. Yeah, I use it across a couple teams and I found it pretty effective at that. Um, uh, a good tip is sometimes the, the multiple standups will step on each other. So it's worth reading through some of the GeekBot documentation. There's a couple of commands that let you reset it so that you can report in on the different standups you're running. Um, so that's one little like tricky thing, but yes, it totally works for many teams. Uh, we use it in a lot of different ways. You can customize it a lot. It's a pretty cool tool. Great. Okay, Reed, I think this one's good for you. Do you have virtual happy hour sessions? Do you have resources for this? Yeah, that's a great, I love it. So I'm a big fan of our virtual happy hours. Uh, so yes, we certainly have them. We actually have a, a couple of things across the company like this. Um, you know, I think Brian talked about some of the video things that we do on watching movies together. Some of the things that I really like is um, our, the team that I'm on, the partnerships team, we actually, well, prior to the coronavirus and COVID you know, kind of pandemic, we actually had, um, bi-weekly, just 30 minute sessions across the team to just come on, talk about anything, just talk about life, just not work related, just really connect with the team. Uh, since everything has happened and you know, we, we took a poll on our team that I recommend doing with your team, to just say, hey, how often do you wanna be meeting? Like, do you want to do a social meeting? Would this help you in your day? Would this help you kind of just feel more productive and social? And so for us, we have an optional 30 minute one daily where people can just hop in. It's every day at 2 p.m. And so if you're free and want to chat with people, you can hop on. And usually, you know, amongst our team, there's like 25% of the teams on at any given point in the day. Some of the other things that we've done is we've really started to embrace some of the remote things that you can do together, whether that's playing, we're a big, you know, at Zapier at our retreats, there's a, a good amount of people that play uh, board games together and other games such as Werewolf. If you're familiar with that, it's it's kind of like a deception style game like Mafia, 
Um, but some of those games can really lend themselves well to Zoom. So we've had groups of people get together to play some games online like that. Uh, just yesterday, for instance, I joined three other colleagues and we had a, um, we did like a card game. We found a website online that allowed you to play um, card, like Euchre is the game that we were playing, really popular game in the Midwest of the US and in Ontario and Canada here. Um, but it was great just to be able to play with each other and we did shared Zoom and then we kind of had a shared screen there. So it was a great way to do it. So I highly recommend doing it. The thing that I would say is be aware of your own company culture, figure out what's going to work for your company, talk to people, poll them. Um, those social things are really going to help a lot of people get through things right now. Uh, and I'm seeing some questions in the chat on what resources are available for that. Uh, I'll try to share some links in the chat of some of the ones that we found to be really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so I think we only have time for a few more questions, but um, here's another one. How do you handle onboarding as a remote company, like getting a new hire, the things they need through training and company culture integration and including them as part of the company and community? Oh, that's a good question. And I, I can take this because we've, we've actually shifted the way we do onboarding a few times as Zapier. So I can kind of give some good context in as to like why we've shifted. So for years, it used to be in person. So we would once, uh, I would say every month or so, all the new folks that we hired would fly out to the Bay Area and we would do kind of a week of working together, um, which really kind of helped set we thought of a, a nice foundation for meeting each other and getting to know each other, which we thought was really, really nice. Um, it eventually got really expensive uh, to do that. And we thought it was a little bit counter to our culture around remote first. So we wanted to try a remote only onboarding. And so in late 2019, we shifted to that. Um, and so far it has actually gone extremely well. And I would say it is much better than doing the in-person. And two concepts that really define you know, great uh, remote onboarding are, the first is asynchronous first. So putting uh, documentation and uh, some of those processes in place, that's, that's probably the most important concept. And the next one is not unique to, I think onboarding at any company, again, is more about graduated autonomy. So the first week or so, is very, very structured, right? It's really focused on company culture. Uh, it's really focused on how we work as an organization and some of the primitives that exist there. So you learn about like the resources and what the initiatives are and how we do work and about our values and that sort of a thing. Um, and a lot of that is repeatable, asynchronous, standardized content. Um, tons of documentation and even where there are live calls where we get everyone together and we run through the same stuff, it still follows a bit of a script but that kind of live touch uh, still allows us to get a best of both worlds where people can ask questions, much like we're doing in the webinar here, um, that allow us to customize and tailor it to uh, things that change over time, right? Um, and then each successive week has less structure and starts to shift more and more towards that role itself rather than you know, overall company um, sort of uh, onboarding. And so for an engineer that might be learning more about your development environment, some of the architectural stuff that's happening, uh, some of the different teams and where they work in the code base. And that, sh that, that of course shifts uh, per role. And the idea is that at the end of 90 days, the expectation is pretty clear that you are more or less fully up to speed on the company and what your role is and what you're kind of doing uh, at Zapier. But there's a big shift from that first week, which is very structured, very asynchronous, very org, focused and it just graduates until you're kind of autonomous within your role and you kind of know what you're trying to accomplish uh, with your team. So that's kind of been the shift that we've made uh, and it's been extremely good. We, we run surveys uh, at the end of each of our sessions and they've gotten better and better and better over the years. Um, much credit goes to our onboarding team as well. Great, thanks Brian. All right, so I think this is gonna be our last question for this session, but um, we will be sending out the ebook, so look out for that, and you will also receive the recording after the webinar. All right, so what are the best ways to keep your teammates engaged? For example, having effective one on one feedback session, best practices from your leaders? I think Janine or Brian? 
I can maybe start with this one and then Brian, if you want to talk about the leadership angle, that would be great. Um, sure. I'm going to find this question in our little list here so I can look at it a little bit more closely while I'm talking. So um, the things that I most often do is I, I really try to set the standard for my team and follow it myself. So if I'm asking everybody to post their daily status in Slack, then it's important for me to do the same thing. Um, I think I use one-on-ones every week to really check in with my team members and make sure that I know what they're working on. I have a good sense of whether they're engaged or not engaged. And if I'm starting to feel like anybody is pulling back or not um, focusing in on the work the right way, that's when I really start to lean in with questions about how they're doing and what they're interested in working on. And I try to always make sure that everybody on my team has something that they're excited about working on and feel really um, kind of personal satisfaction about tackling. Some people like to churn through a whole bunch of small tasks all at once and they love to cross stuff off their to-do list and other people really um, kind of get more satisfaction about working on a larger project. So for those different kinds of employees, I really try to understand what they like to do and why they like to do it and give them things that will help to feed their um, kind of positive feeling in addition to getting us to move forward on, on the work we need to do. Those are some of the things I do just like around engagement specifically. And then in terms of one-on-ones, I have a one-on-one -on -one with all of my direct reports every week and I have a one-on-one -on -one with my manager uh, every week as well. We sometimes do skip levels to make sure that my employees have a chance to talk to my manager so that we can make sure that everything is working well within the team as a whole. Uh, those are some of the things that I am I'm using. I don't have a standard set of questions that I use in my one-on-ones, but I just kind of really try to get information about how everyone is doing, especially now. Um, I just really find it important to know that kind of um, kind of personal information. Like, are you finding your work valuable? Are you enjoying the work that you're doing? And if the answer is no, then it's time for us to have a conversation about if we need to change assignments a little bit or just to really make sure they understand what we need to focus on. Um, Brian, do you want to tackle the leadership process a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the one thing I will tag on to with one-on-ones is leadership also does, uh, in, in a similar vein, skip levels really often. So this is a great way to get that kind of great, that, that insight and information into what's happening in the organization. So those feel and look very similar to one-on-ones. Um, so uh, a lot of leaders do those. Um, beyond that, it, it doesn't start, it doesn't shift much in terms of like a leadership or executive role in a remote environment of which all of our, you know, all of our leadership team uh, is fully remote as well. Besides, I mean, setting aside time to think and to write and to share and be transparent about what's going on is still critical. And there's a few different ways that we do that uh, internally. Um, and there are things that you all uh, leaning into a more remote uh, culture uh, could, could adopt. Uh, one is a bit of an internal blog, right? So you could think of this as a place where you would go to publish uh, significant uh, uh, bits of, you know, pros that would cover some of the challenges the company is facing, uh, some of the challenges with different projects and things like that. Things where the audience is more than one or two people or even a team, right? Um, and that's a great way you can use, I mean, you could host your own WordPress. You could designate a Slack room and do uh, like do posts inside of there. There's all kinds of different things you could do on that front, uh, but I would highly recommend that. Uh, and we also do an all hands uh, call. And that's, that's really around sharing uh, many different uh, or sharing information to everyone in the team. And it's actually run by a Zoom call much like this, uh, where we invite the entire company in. And usually there's a topic, there's announcements, uh, and we're able to dig into uh, what's going on inside the organization. And we invite folks from across the org. Um, and that's usually very executive leadership driven, where we're trying to you know, put something out there and really highlight it. Um, and those are recorded and shared on the internal blog. So folks who are in different time zones can of course pick up uh, and, uh, you know, participate um, as best they can. And we shift those around. So sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's in the afternoon uh, to try to capture people at uh, different times. So those are two things that I would definitely recommend and uh, things that are not too difficult to adopt inside of uh, your organization to help disseminate important information, especially from the leadership or executive ranks. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian, Reed, and Janine, and everyone else who joined our webinar today. We hope that you learned a little bit more about working remote. And look out for an email from us with the recording link to this webinar and for our ebook. Thank you all so much again for joining, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.